And a cheerful good morning to everyone. This is Roy Porter in the NBC newsroom in New York, winding up another week of global news tours. The Russians are still criticizing the Truman Plan. General Marshall has summoned General Clay, his answer man, to Moscow. The rebels seem to be winning in the Paraguayan Revolution, and repercussions from the Big Four conferences are being felt around the world. Our timetable depends on sunspots again this morning. First a word from your announcer, then I'll be back with your World News Roundup. Expansion of our public health services, the Veterans Administration, and the widespread use of hospitalization plans has created tremendous new demands on our medical service and hospital facilities. This means that thousands of trained nurses are urgently needed. To help fill these needs, the more than 1,300 accredited schools of nursing throughout the country are offering a superb three-year course which will train America's young women for new and greater opportunities in the nursing profession. If you are between the ages of 18 and 35 or a high school graduate or college student in good standing and are in good health, you may be eligible to enroll for the student nursing course. For full details, get in touch with your nearest school of nursing or local hospital. Now back to the NBC Newsroom and the World News Roundup. The Russians are still criticizing the Truman Plan for assistance to Greece and Turkey, and this morning the Communist Party newspaper Pravda carries a long editorial calling the program a policy of imperialist expansion under the guise of charity. You'll remember this is the second time in two days that the Russian press has gone down the line on the Truman proposition. Izvestia, the government paper, yesterday said we were trying to interfere in the business of other states. Now today Pravda declares that Mr. Truman not only disregarded the obligations of the United States as a member of the United Nations, but pretended to a leading role in this organization. While all this editorial battling is going on, our Secretary of State Marshall and Russian Foreign Minister Molotov are fencing with definitions of democracy. And only a short time ago, Marshall summoned to Moscow Lieutenant General Lucius Clay, the new military governor of the American Zone in Germany, and the longtime policy planner, who has all the answers to our occupation activities. Clay will go to the Big Four meeting to sit close to and supply the answers for General Marshall. President Truman, meanwhile, is getting sunburned at Key West, and disregarding both Izvestia and Pravda, he's gone fishing. Rest and relaxation are his primary considerations for the next few days, and he's already paid his income tax, so that's off his mind. At the United Nations, Britain's plans to toss the Palestine question into the international organization are expected for next week, but the British still have not stated their case. And now for the first of our direct reports, let's try for the Big Four conference again this morning. Come in, Henry Cassidy, in Moscow. Set on one of the most intriguing questions of post-war Europe. How many German prisoners of war the Soviet Union has had, and what is becoming of them? In a document released early this morning and published in today's press, the Russians stated they have set nearly two million Germans. Out of this figure, one million three thousand and one hundred and seventy-four have been freed and sent back to Germany. Eight hundred and ninety thousand and five hundred and thirty-two German war prisoners are still kept in the Soviet Union. The document was released after the foreign ministers conferring in Moscow agreed to exchange information on the number of German war prisoners held by each of the four powers. The Russian statement does not say how many German war prisoners are working on various projects in the Soviet Union, nor did it reveal when the Soviets intend to release the German war prisoners still in Russia. NBC correspondent Henry Cassidy has just reported from the conference headquarters of the Moscow Hotel that the deputies for Germany finally failed this morning in their efforts to decide the form of participation of other armed powers in the peace. Unable to decide whether Albania should sit on the proposed American political body, the deputies referred the question back to the minister. The United States Ambassador Murphy said he would be failure with embarrassment and shame. The deputies for Austria failed to come to any agreement on disposal of German assets in that country and decided that each deputy should make an individual report to this minister. Today's meeting of the ministers deals with the problem of displaced persons and the problem of the reorganization of Germany. Dr. Marshall this morning received the Chinese ambassador who is moving fast and has seen bad in Christ in the last 24 hours. 
The status of the ambassador has voiced objections to the proposed discussion of China by the foreign minister. His belief of presence has not yet reached a decision, and it's not the right of our Secretary Marshall has. This is Robert Magritte in Moscow. The civil war in Paraguay seems to be moving toward a victory for the Concepcion rebels. Here's David Wilson in Buenos Aires. Dictator Julio Morinico of Paraguay is this morning making a desperate attempt to form something resembling an army to oppose the increasing rebel forces now advancing on his fortified capital, Asuncion. Reports from that threatened city, seeping through a strict censorship, acknowledge that Morinico recalled to active service all retired officers of reserve groups to train civilians for the capital's defense. Some reports said that 15-year-old youths were being drafted for the government army. The rebels have rein been reinforced by nearly 30,000 men from the Chaco Army, the best equipped force in Paraguay, according to rebel reports, which if true mean that Moringo's army is now outnumbered by three to one and completely outclassed in materiel. The rebels are reported to have anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns, artillery and heavy machine guns at their disposal. Both sides of this civil war, however, are refraining from reporting on military operations in detail. But three days ago, the government said that the revolt was restricted to Concepcion, and 48 hours ago it said that the rebels were 50 miles further south, and yesterday stated that government troops were ready to make a stand at San Pedro, 30 miles nearer the capital and main objective of the rebel army. Meanwhile, United States diplomatic representatives in South America are following closely the events in Paraguay, where according to Marine Eagle government, the revolution is led by communists. At a time when Washington is endeavoring to halt communism from spreading in southern Europe, the possibility of a communist government in South America, right on the United States' back door, is to say the least disturbing. But these reports of communism have not been confirmed. If anything, they have been denied. In Montevideo, former foreign minister Rodriguez Larreta called the Paraguayan government's assertion ridiculous. In Brazil, the important newspaper Correio da Manhã called Mourinho a liar. And in Bolivia, a congressman compared Mourinho with Villarreal who last year was strung up a lamppost and hanged in the Bolivian capital. This is David Wilson in Buenos Aires. Big Four reaction in Moscow has been varied recently, with reflections of political opinions on both sides of the current discussion. Let's have the story from Merrill Muller in London. British reaction to President Truman's statement on Greece and Turkey, and to the Moscow statements which have followed President Truman, have been rather mixed. For the most part, the British are delighted that the United States is going to take an active role of some sort, be it only financial, in the Middle East. But there are voices, mostly among the rebel ranks of the Labour Party in the House of Commons, who say that President Truman's remarks are nothing but dollar imperialism and are not really progressive politics for the peace of the future. The main local news, however, from England today are raging floods and blizzards which have all but crippled the country again. The situation is described as disastrous. Southern and Western England and the Midlands are extensively flooded, with all but one river reported still to be rising, further endangering the revived manufacturing efforts, agriculture, and towns and villages. Wales is experiencing a full blizzard that is expected to sweep north and east later in the day, with the possibility of some snowfall over most of the country. However, Britain is again one entity today as far as land transportation is concerned. None of the main north to south roads are open, but single line rail traffic has been made possible on two railroads. Only five passenger trains got through, but 98 coal trains are on the move to London. No coal ships have been able to sail because of the storm. Coal deliveries are not keeping level with consumption, so that the two weeks reserve on which Britain re reopened her industry has started to dwindle again. Another major highlight of the weather was the flood situation which struck East London. One of the main water purifying stations for the city, which is virtually isolated by flood water, has become flooded with Thames River filth. More than one million people are now cut off without water. The London Water Board immediately requested water restrictions throughout the rest of the capital, and emergency water trucks started meager deliveries in the affected area. This is Merrill Muller in London. Tax reduction proposals and help to smaller countries under the Truman Plan are the two important subjects in the nation's capital today. Let's get the story from Leith Eid in Washington. With Congress already finding the foreign question about as easy to handle as an armful of eels with their mittens on, some of the men on the hill are anxiously scanning the eastern sky to find out how many more anti-communist chickens will finally come to roost on the U.S. Treasury over here. 
They think they've spotted at least five more, all ready to take off for Washington from the Middle East and Europe. Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Hungary. They don't know how much it's going to cost to nourish all these anti-communist birds, but they figure that Uncle Sam would have to shell out well over $1 billion at a rough estimate. And for an economy-minded Congress, that gives to think. So among other things, the House Foreign Affairs Committee is trying to work into the Greek-Turkish $400 million bill are clauses that say that President Truman wouldn't have to give the Greeks and Turks all this money at once, and he could stop if he thought they'd had enough, and also to make sure that Congress gets a full accounting. The State Department bill to be introduced next Monday is only in rough draft, but influential House members say there'll have to be substantial revision. And from there, you go to thoughts about taxes. Democratic Representative Dalton, the former chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, says we ought to go slow because of new dark clouds hanging over the world. But Republican Representative Knutson, who's chairman now, counts 15 Republican noses on the committee to 10 Democratic noses and says it's still 20% across the board. And incidentally, today is March 15th, and the deadline for income tax returns is midnight tonight. Otherwise, in Washington, this morning, Raymond Foley, the House Admi- Housing Administrator, says mortgage insurance applications these last two months indicate the largest volume of home construction in FHA history. And this morning, Senator Taft warns his fellow Republicans against political shenanigans in the White House appointment of postmasters. So far, the Senate hasn't okayed a single one of nearly 600 postmaster nominations pending. But Taft says he thinks that if they've passed their civil service exams on the level and they're qualified, the Republicans should confirm them, even if they are Democrats. This is Leif Eid in Washington. Over in Tokyo, at the trial of indicted Japanese war criminals, the defense has undertaken to show that Japan was fearful of and acted against communism in the Far East. This newest move has been interpreted in some quarters as propaganda, which is designed to benefit the defendants' cases in view of the present world situation. Representatives of more than half a million railroad workers have decided to ask for 20 cents an hour more, a wage demand which appears to set the pace for other unions. This pay boost, if it's put through, will affect more than 300 different lines. There's more news. I'll be back in a moment. Now, here's your announcer. Although the Selective Service Act is about to become a thing of the past, and our veterans of World War II are now mostly back to civilian life, we Americans are building ourselves a brand new army. It's an army quite different from any we've ever had before, if only because its makeup is based on many of the lessons learned from the last war. The enlisted man and officer in today's United States Army must still be good on his feet and handy with conventional firearms. But he's learning also how to use a lot of new gadgets that have become useful in modern warfare. Every Army man, whether in the infantry, artillery, or air force, is expected to become familiar with and skilled in the use of one or more specialized weapons. Weapons employing such devices as radar, jet, or rocket propulsion, infrared night viewing equipment, or electronic calculators. The Army today goes in for large-scale scientific research, conducting experiments in the effects of extreme warm and cold climate on men and equipment, making new discoveries in the field of preventive medicine and surgery. This is your United States Army today. Now back to Roy Porter in the newsroom. South America may have another revolution on its hands, this time in Ecuador. Reports from Quito, the capital, say that the revolt was due to start yesterday. But the plot was discovered, some of the men involved were sent to jail, and others escaped. And from Beijing in China, the government central news agency says today that fighting has been intensified south of the Sungari River, where the communists are thrusting southward toward Chongchun, Manchuria's capital. The agency estimated that nine communist divisions have now crossed the Sungari, shuttling in and out of weakly held government territory. And from Athens, reports from Salonika said that the United Nations Balkan Investigating Commission is going to ask Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia to confirm or deny statements attributed to him concerning Greece. That's your World News Roundup. I'll be back on Monday. This is Roy Porter in the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.